warm welcome to this um, webinar about Cyber Threat Landscape 2024, so how to navigate the new risks. Um, and this webinar is hosted by OPIT, Open Institute of Technology. I'm very happy to welcome you all today. My name is Greta, I'm Head of Marketing and Admissions, and I'm here today with two very important speakers. We have Professor Sambad Star, he is Area Chair of the Our Masters in Enterprise Cybersecurity. Welcome, Tom. Thank you. And we have Venetia Solomon. Uh, she is um, the Cyber Queen, <laughs> Cloud Security Architect, uh, Cyber Security Diversity Advocate, and a Community Builder. Hello, Venetia. Hello, Greta. Thank you. For, thank you for having me. Okay, the two of them will discuss about these cybersecurity risks um, after a very brief presentation about OPIT. So, who we are? Um, so. We are a higher education institution whose mission is really to unlock progress and employment uh, on a global scale. We want to provide top education, and this webinar is a proof of that. It is also modern and irrelevant for the, the world we live in, affordable as well, in the field of technology. So uh, OPIT stands apart from other institutions because we are, as I said, as an institution that is recognized and accredited, so our degrees are recognized in Europe and beyond, also in the US, Canada, etc. We are fully online, so we have the flexibility to study and work or to attend lessons from anywhere in the world. We are really focused on technology, which is relevant today, and that's why we are career-oriented. So our courses are designed and done with faculty and uh, company professionals that really are looking into what is needed today or, or tomorrow and how to foster technology in a way that can enforce, like, and make sure the business thrives. Uh, our support is always available. And as I said, we're also inclusive and affordable in terms of fees and the uh, tools that we use for you to study. Our faculty is, uh, we're very proud of our faculty, is an example of quality that we want to, to give to everybody. The rector is being Prime Minister, uh, former Minister of Education of Italy in um, Professor Fufumo, and also a Dean and Rector of one of the most important polytechnic in, in the world. Um, we have professors coming from all over the world. Tom is an example, but we have professors coming from the US, from Canada, Europe, Asia, and they also are uh, professionals, so they work in different uh, companies. You can find out more in our, on our website. For instance, they come from uh, Morgan Stanley, McKinsey, PayPal, Microsoft, and so on and so forth, or from very important universities as well. So they, they teach in both OPIS and other universities. Okay, so but now I don't want to take any time from this very important discussion, and I will leave the floor to Tom and Venetia to uh, discuss about these new risks of cyber threats. Okay, thank you, Greta, and let me share my screen. Let me know if you see it. You should yeah. see it, right? Yeah. Yes. Okay, great. Well, hello everyone, and thank you for joining us here today. Um, the topic is we are navigating new risks. Basically, we're talking about the cyber threat landscape for 2024. And I'm really happy that be before this meeting, we have discussed briefly you know, about the audience that's joining today. I'm really happy that our attendees are, are all around the world. And this is so great because this is, this is stressing out how important this topic of cybersecurity is. Uh, we'll be talking about the world of cybersecurity we will focus on challenges that we faced this year and also how we can tackle them um so let me just change slide okay i have prepared this made this presentation in four different groups so there are four key areas that i think they're important that we'll explore today and each one is really i can tell you it's it's a game changer in the cybersecurity landscape so first uh, we'll talk about uh, the double-edged sword of artificial intelligence, cybersecurity, because artificial intelligence, it's, there is lots of hype for it, and it's being discussed in the media. Um, but in cybersecurity, it's more important than ever. So we'll talk about how uh, it can be both a powerful tool also, and it can be also a threat for organizations. Then we'll talk about uh, the social engineering evolution, about the tactics and how cyber criminals are getting smarter also and getting more sophisticated in their attempts to manipulate us. 
And this is also thanks to artificial intelligence because they're also learning as much as we are trying to be you know, on, up to speed with the knowledge they're, they're doing the same. After that, the next step, the next chapter will be talking about the ransomware and how it's bec becoming um, really important business for cyber criminals. And we'll talk about the ransomware as a service. And finally, we will talk about something that's really important. It's about geopolitical cyber threats. So let's move on uh, to our first topic. And this is the artificial intelligence in cybersecurity. To talk about uh, artificial intelligence, cybersecurity, first we need to understand where we are now with artificial intelligence. Many people heard for the first time about with the rise of ChatGPT in 2002, there is artificial intelligence and you can create haiku poems and something, you know, but many people still don't understand actually how you can use cybersecurity in daily life and not even to mention how to use it in cybersecurity. I relate this to mid 80s when I was a little bit younger than now, and uh, we witnessed the rise of microcomputers. So Clive Sinclair invented ZX Spectrum. And there was Commodore 64, and this was the age actually when computing power was in your home. It was easily accessible, and for me, it was really important. Now you can play games, you can do stuff, but there was also opportunity that you can program. And after that, there was DOS, the disk operating system at the end of the 80s, beginning of the 90s. And after that, we witnessed the rise of Windows. So this is now where we are in history. It's early 90s, now in 2024. We are moving. ChatGPT is we're prompting DOS operating system. We're also prompting. Fast forward many years now, 2024. We are talking about the artificial intelligence in cybersecurity. And this is the area that I have separated in four uh, different chapters. But before I'm talking about this, you know, maybe, Venetia, you would like to add something to, to the artificial intelligence in cybersecurity. Yeah, Tom, I mean, I think I, I absolutely love the journey that, that you've taken us on now in terms of really saying where we come from and where we are now. I think what's fascinating is that Almost every person that's using a some sort of computing device today is using uh, some form of artificial intelligence and some of the machine learning capabilities, whether they are aware of it or not, right? And so I think that that is definitely an interesting perspective and observation. And organizations are going to see very many benefits of AI, but I'm I'm wondering if you have any thoughts on how organizations can really benefit the benefit or balance the benefits of AI in cybersecurity, you know, what the potential of the risks that's introduced by AI driven threat. I mean, how how do you see this balancing out? Yes, good question. Um when we talk about artificial intelligence, I always make a parallel with cybersecurity. Basically, in artificial intelligence, if you know cybersecurity, principles are the same. So knowing how cybersecurity works, it's actually it's very applicable to artificial intelligence. So the way to implement cybersecurity would be how to implement AI. So basically, you would need a governance framework for AI. Like in cybersecurity, information security, you have 27 AI, so 27,000 series how to govern and implement information security management system. There is ISO 42000, how to implement, and it's been out for like, I don't know, month, two months, something like that, uh, how to implement artificial intelligence management system. Many companies are just now exploring actually how to do that because they don't even have cybersecurity, not to speak artificial intelligence. But this is the future and it's going really, really fast and we need to be up to speed with knowledge. Uh, then it's um, the ethical guidelines. With artificial intelligence, there, there are many risks. And the initial thing that companies did was to ban, to forbid the usage of artificial intelligence because they don't really have time, they don't understand how to do it, and they would like to learn of somebody else's mistakes. So what happened here now? Now we have the rise of shadow AI. Like we have shadow IT where people use their own 
uh, technology. You know, now we have shadow AI where people are using. I don't know. Everybody knows about ChatGPT, and they use ChatGPT on their smart devices. They input confidential information, documentation from companies, business secrets, whatever. So this is what's what's making really shadow AI right now. And it's a, it's a really big threat because there's customer data. There's lots of stuff that people are doing on a site only because it's not being governed uh, the way it should be governed. Um, so there, there should be also an, an oversight mechanism, you know, control framework. How, when you use artificial intelligence, when you use cybersecurity, when you use artificial intelligence in cybersecurity, how do you govern? How do you ensure transparency? It's important from the perspective of data protection, you know, the GDP, GDPR regulations, there, there are other privacy acts in the world. This has to be designed in a way that it's not jeopardizing anyone's privacy, anyone's freedom, that customers understand how the systems are being used. You know, so it, it needs to be really, really, really transparent. Yeah. And go ahead. Sorry. I mean, I mean, yeah, I agree with you. I think from an ethical uh, consideration perspective, the transparency is so important. I mean, uh, just about over a week ago now, I saw that the EU passed the first version or the first draft of the, the actual AI Act, you know, so those governance models and frameworks are definitely coming into play. But it's also then about accountability. You know, it's like, who's accountable for things that take place in the space of AI? And how do we ensure that AI doesn't infringe on, for example, privacy rights? How do we ensure that we overcome all of these biases when it comes to decision making uh, from an AI perspective. There's so many things to consider when it comes to AI and, and cybersecurity. And I think organizations really need to prepare for this, this future evolution you know, of AI in cybersecurity. But what do you think this means if you consider this from a from a pure cybersecurity perspective in terms of both like defensive security and offensive security with, when we when we think about AI and cybersecurity as a whole. Okay, this is a very, very complex uh, topic, but I would always say that it's about transparency, transparency in, in AI and operations uh, where you need to allow users to understand you know, how is AI being used in cybersecurity and measures. People don't like to be controlled, that's the thing. But you as an organization, you need to ensure that you have under control how your employees are also using client data, business secrets, you know, then the same principles as in cybersecurity, you know, it's accountability also. Uh, for AI decisions, you know, especially in cases of false positives. There is an example um, two weeks ago from Canada, one of the airlines, airline companies, you know, they had chatbot on their website and people were talking to chatbot and chatbot offered them uh, discounts and tickets and everything. So the company said, well, we're not responsible for this. You know? But the court ruled actually in, in, in customer's favor because the chatbot promised them and the company didn't have really this under control. So it's really important that you have your, your AI system also under control. For them, probably it was easy money. You know, it's easy to implement. You don't need don't need any more customer service centers. You just put AI there, but it's not trained well. There are no security measures around it. There is no control. And then it's really, really easy to, to screw up everything. So you have issues, issues as a company. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. I think uh, the reality is like. AI, of course, when it comes from a data-driven perspective, outsmarts the current attack vectors already as it is today. And, and I think therein lies the challenge. But organizations are going to greatly benefit from the use of AI. But the only reality is that if you need people not to implement any type of rogue versions of AI, then I think from an organizational consideration perspective, it's also like, what do you then give instead? Because yes, you can put in place the rules, the policies, the governance, the framework, but how do you then solve the problem that the business has from an advancement perspective? And, and I think that is a, a real issue here when we consider technical controls and technical threats from a cybersecurity perspective. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. 
Well, the yeah. thing is with this AI driven cyber threats, you know, they can also outsmart your systems. So basically corporations, they have to implement also their own AI and hence uh, threat detection systems in place um, through techniques like adversarial AI, where the attackers use manipulated data to deceive your AI model. And you, how, how would you mitigate this? Uh, you can employ like continuous learning, like you have to educate your employees. You also have to educate and train your AI model all the time um, to to adopt different strategies for AI systems. You know, need to really know how to use them. And th 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 here's the thing: you know, many people are afraid. You know, they're going to lose jobs because of AI. But if you if, if our audience is listening carefully, basically there is an industry revolution right now, and people will have to acquire new knowledge, learn how to use AI in business processes. Because what I'm saying now, you need to train the AI system. Yes, you need to train the AI system so it can protect you. It's much faster. It never sleeps. You know, it, there is no human error. And, and th this is the beauty of, of AI. You just need to learn how to how to use it. Yeah. And I would also say, I would also say um, the future of people who are, who, are, who are going to work in AI are actually... Uh, business process analysts, you know, people who understand business processes because they already have the knowledge of business process. You just need to learn how AI can be applicable here. So this is a beauty for people who are studying and learning about cybersecurity. You also need to learn how to use AI and implement in cybersecurity and you will be so powerful. Um, then going back to your question, then it's about the updating system with the latest threat intelligence. So you're always up to date with, with the latest in the world of threats and artificial intelligence is using this data to, to guard against other AI systems that are attacking you. Yeah. Um, yeah. Then it's also, uh, one more thing, there is also layered security measures. This is something that we did before, but it's not only it's not only because of AI, but it's a good practice to have layered security, not rely on one control, but have multiple of them. Yeah, I think maybe the final the final point that I have here before we move on to the next session, or actually a challenge or question that I would pose is, what about then? What about the data privacy and protection? So, what role does data privacy and protection? Uh, play actually in the deployment of AI in cybersecurity? Well, data privacy is, well, I mean, when GDPR came in 2000, what, 2018, originally organiza organizations had to implement. Now it's more important than ever because right now nobody wants their personal data being used to train large language models. And this is something that organizations have to ensure like before, you know, they're securing and anonymizing data, storing in safe places, whatever, uh, from a cybersecurity perspective. But now with AI, they also have to ensure that this data is not being manipulated and it's not being used against people. So privacy is more important than ever. And also ethical standards are more important than ever. Uh, for instance, in financial institution, you cannot use personal data of your client to ban him from getting a loan or something because you will give him low risk rating because of something that AI detected about him. And so organizations have to develop their own ethical standards. And that's why it's important what you mentioned before, AI Act. It's not here to stop the industrial revolution, but it's here actually to protect us as citizens of our countries, to protect us from being manipulated from being our data being being stolen or used for purpose purposes that we didn't permit or we're not even aware of that exist yeah, yeah. yeah absolutely so this is this is from the privacy perspective um okay so let's go uh, to the next slide it's about social engineering evolution. So basically social engineering uh, is never ending topic. And now when we talked about um, artificial intelligence, it's logical actually step to talk also about phishing, smishing, wishing, wishing. They're different, different issues. Uh, but what is common for everything is that social engineering exploits human psychology to create something new, fear, sense of urgency or something, so cyber criminals can gain access 
to your data or to your system. Um, let's go next slide here. Um, so when we talk about, and we're talking here, and when we talk about phishing, it's about talking about human-centric cyber threats. So I mentioned artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence is now something that cyber criminals are using to create beautifully crafted emails that they don't have any more grammatical errors. They're, they look perfect on screen and it's re really, really uh, easy for them to attack you. But it's really hard also for people who are getting these emails you know, to spot that there, there are some irregularities. Yeah, I mean, it's it's so interesting because up until now we I feel like we've evolved so much and we've we've really become smarter as humans and defense controls in spotting phishing attacks over the years. But now with the introduction of AI for this purpose, it is so much more complex because the the phishing attacks and especially when it comes to spear phishing is so precise. You know, it's so precise based on data about the target. And it's it's really, really a challenge for the defensive technology controls because there is, of course, the regular awareness, uh, you know, training and development for users where you can create that kind of awareness. But then in addition to that, there's the technical controls. And if these attacks are so precise, uh, how how do we how do you foresee the advancement in the technical controls going in this space? Are we also going to be seeing a lot more AI built controls for the purpose of counteracting the human centric based phishing attack? Yeah, so this this has become a good question. This is becoming so complex now. Uh, what the organizations can do, but not only organizations, but also each one of us needs to do. You know, you need to. First, you need to enhance your uh, email security measures. Basically, you need to have some filtering solution. If you're using Gmail, there is already a filtering solution in place. But this is something that large organizations can can do also, or, and already do on their site to notice that there is something phishing. Before, they only have spam filters, but now you have phishing filters that would, that would spot phishing emails. Use of artificial intelligence is here actually a wonderful application because it would detect a pattern if there is something wrong with, with this email, you know, and then it would warn the user about the potential phishing attempt. Um, then it's education. It's really important for people to learn how phishing works, what phishing is. Many people think it's not going to happen to me. It happens to somebody else. Yeah. What you need to develop is actually critical thinking. You need to understand that you are the target and somebody wants your data. Many times we're not even aware of the value of our data. Like, oh, it's only an email. Well, yeah, through this email, you can really get access to everything about me, to everything about the organization. So that's why it's also important to update uh, software and update systems, uh, to patch regularly. You know, when there is a security update, everybody needs to update their system because there is a potential of zero-day attacks. Uh, anybody can get anybody who is malicious can get into into your system. So what I also mentioned is this culture of, going back to what I said about critical thinking, it's the culture of skepticism. So you need to be really always suspicious about who is sending this, why is it sending. Even though if you know there is a familiar name, don't click immediately on a link that somebody sent you because you are familiar with the name. This is the rule number one, how somebody is going to deceive you. Uh, then it's really important uh, for organizations to do regular training of their employees. And this is not the one-time event. This is something that happens through some period in time. The best application would be gamification. So basically, you're doing your daily work, and in the control environment, the organization is sending you fake phishing emails just to train you, to, to, to make sure that when you get it, you'll have to do some action. If you open it, Okay, you probably failed the test or something, but you will get the warning from the system that will be educational. It will let you know how you should, what you need to change on your side. So this, this is actually what organizations can do uh, from their perspective, you know, to help employees 
not to click on everything. And this is basically, we as humans are the first line of defense. And 80% of all the data leakages that happen in organizations is because the first line of defense is breached. And we as people, in many time you are just overloaded with work and you have stuff to do. And this is actually when the phishing comes in, you know, it's your weakness. You're tired, you don't really care so much. You're just going to click on something because somebody sent you an email. And by this automation and, and with, without you being skeptical and, and critical thinking, you create a problem without even realizing that you create a problem. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And I, I think when you mentioned the regular training and awareness, I think this is absolutely key and gamification of that because otherwise, you know, the training can become repetitive. And then it's also just a click through content exercise for users. But one thing that really is challenge is is a challenge these days is when we look over to the AI and social engineering space, right? So currently, I mean, AI tools have really, really allowed for a lot more personalized and convincing social engineering attack. So if we think about training and awareness, or we think about technical measures, I mean, what what do you foresee as preventative measures for these types of attacks? And, and I'm talking about the specific cases where, for example, you do get the phone call with the C, CIO's voice on the call, um, giving you the instruction to do something. And it really is their voice, their personality. You know, it, it really is that good and it really is that personalized. Uh, how do you foresee us moving forward in terms of countermeasures for, for that? Well, basically, every company needs to have their own strategy, how they're going to train their employees. And this goes back to development of cybersecurity culture. And you know, cybersecurity culture is closely connected to the corporate culture, your mission, your vision of a company, your, your statement of purpose, your values, everything is applicable also to cybersecurity. So this is not only, and also to artificial intelligence, but it's not artificial intelligence specific. Uh, so basically your employees, they need to understand what the values of the company. And then your cybersecurity culture is the one that is leaning closely to those values and everything and teaches you how, you, because you need to leave the culture, how to behave in an organization. And this is not something that you would do overnight. Uh, you need to nurture, you need to grow your culture, and it's going to take probably 18 months before you have some sort of result. Because what happens in between? You know, people come and go from organizations. They're overloaded with different projects. And this is something where, where the role of human resource department is really important in every organization that they have close alliance with uh, with the security department, so they actually jointly develop the strategy on how to grow this cybersecurity culture. Because as I said, the first line of defense is us, humans. We cannot do anything by ourselves, but as a collective, with the help within the organization, we can actually increase uh, the, the, the resilience of the first level of support and increase resilience of the, of the company, you know, and making everything more secure. It's not everything about the technical measures. Yeah, I agree. I agree. I think where where technology can perhaps become an, an advancement or a strong ally for us here, specifically AI, is if we if we use the same platforms to basically incorporate real life scenarios, right? In in the interactive training. So I think the training has to be interactive and it has to be a continuous improvement cycle. But I think we can use AI for on, on the defensive side and the preventative side to also run those scenarios inside of our organization with the people inside of the organization and actually kind of build that security minded culture. Because I think the more you can get people to realize that anybody can be a victim of this, the more people do not want to be a victim of this, right? The more, I mean, when you create that awareness, people do not want to be, we, we used to call them the clickers. So when it comes to phishing simulation, people didn't want to be the clickers. So they did everything so that they don't have to be on the list of clickers. Uh, so in this case, you know, people really need that real world kind of simulation so that they are also updated with the new tactics so that, you know, that ultimately is this continuous cycle of improving the awareness 
by also enhancing the awareness with the evolution of AI, really. Absolutely, I agree with you. Uh, because the best way we learn, this is something what I mentioned before, let's see what other side is doing. Let's see what our competitors are doing. Here, it's also about the real world, real world social engineering, you know, uh, incidents, it's actually, you see, okay, what's happening out there? And there is an awesome database, uh, open source, sorry, um, uh, database with information about what happened in different organizations. Uh, there are different databases explaining actually different types of, of attacks that are, that are social uh, engineering relevant. And for an organization, it's important that to, to build an educational program that will have a mix of real world case studies so people can actually understand how this works in the real world because just telling somebody theory you know there is a malware there is phishing you know don't click on it people don't really relate to that what they relate to it's actually what happened to somebody else and then you learn from somebody else's mistakes and this is only because also it's the human nature you know we are we are reactive and when you go into prevention and that's something a little bit more difficult because you need to think about it and you need to be innovative. It's always easier to be reactive and then learn on your own experience when you get burned. But then many times it's already too late when that happens. Yeah, yeah exactly. Okay, so let's move. Oh, sorry, do you have any other questions about this? No, I think we can move on. Okay, so let's talk a little bit more now about ransomware. Uh, Ransomware, it's not something new. It's been around for, for many years, and it's the natural product of phishing that we discussed before. So basically, when you click on that email, and this is now the, the cases we're discussing, you click on a link, you download through a drop, you dropper on your, on your computer that downloads malware, and suddenly your system is infected, and you have no idea that it's being infected, but somebody's actually sitting in your system. Well, each malware works in a different way. And basically, it's here to to, uh, call, to steal money from you. This is what it does. There are different types of malware. But when you talk about ransomware, this is actually the most sophisticated one. Uh, what happens, it encrypts your data. And there are many organizations that are facing this uh, on a daily basis. And basically, cyber criminals, they are demanding from you to pay ransom, ransomware. Oh, sorry, to pay ransom for uh decryption keys and this is something that's being a worldwide problem and what happened a few years ago there is something the rise of ransomware as a service or ras model basically you don't have to develop your own tools you can go on the dark net and you can actually rent ransomware for somebody you probably heard about Logbit. It was in the media a couple of weeks ago. Logbit, the most famous, actually, the most easily accessible ransomware. You pay certain money to somebody, and then you actually deploy Logbit to thousands of computers, log them, and negotiate for for ransom. Um, so let's talk um, about this landscape, uh, threat landscape here. Um, the thing is, this was the evolution. We're talking about artificial intelligence, industrial revolution, but there is also a revolution of ransomware. And this model, ransomware as a service, is actually something that's uh, being out there. It's really easily accessible. And uh, for the future of computing, it's a big issue because many companies are not ready. There are statistics that like 70 or 80% of small business enterprises don't have any cybersecurity protection and ransomware is something, especially ransomware as a service, which is easily accessible, is the major, major threat for them. Yeah, yeah, I think... I mean, the ransomware as a service is is a major issue because it really, you know, has a democratized ransomware and the means for anyone to really launch these attacks, as you mentioned. And I think from a cybersecurity strategy perspective, it's really not only about the focusing on the prevention of ransomware, but it is also about working together to disrupt these mm -hmm. ransomware distribution networks, because if we are able to effectively disrupt the distribution networks, then you know we can hamper the progress of ransomware as a service. 
Right. And we are now what we are witnessing now is the increase in, in the volume of, and sophistication of of attacks with ransomware only because ransomware as a service is easily accessible and you don't really need any technical knowledge. You just need to buy it and then deploy and attack people you know, and then you collect collect money. Of course, everything is illegal that, <laughs> that I'm saying, but it's out there. You know, dark economy is actually much bigger than our regular economy. Well, this, yeah. this is how it works. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, when you when you consider some of the most effective strategies for preventing ransomware attacks, especially more sophisticated ransomware attacks, what what, what do you consider as some of the most effective strategies in this case? Okay. This is something I've been I've been asked uh, many times. How can we protect and how can we be more secure? Uh, and this is something that I mentioned also before uh, on phishing. Uh, you need to update and you need to patch your system all the time to close vulnerabilities. So basically, each week there are new vulnerabilities. And if you cannot do it by yourself in your small business or in large organization, you know, there has to be process in place. How you do it, when you do it, and nothing can be, no, no vulnerabilities should be untouched. Um, it's also, we mentioned before, training, but it's really important to train employees to recognize, you know, whether there, there is a phishing attempt, you know, and which is usually initial vector, how you get uh, ransomware infection. Uh, then you need to implement also advanced EDR, uh, and endpoint detection and response solutions uh, to identify and to mitigate threats on time. Um, what is also important is to restrict user permission on uh, in, in the system uh, to limit the spread of ransomware and within your network. Um, another thing is uh, network segmentation, because if somebody's sitting in your network, you know, they do lateral movement and they go different places. So it's really important to segment your network uh, to protect critical assets. So all these strategies that I mentioned uh, they're, they represent multiple layers of defense, and they're making it also at the same time by doing it like this. You know, it's more challenging for ransomware also to penetrate and to spread within an organization. Yeah, yeah, I I agree with you, and I think from a technical perspective, sometimes this is also it's it's often uh, an overthought scenario where network segmentation is absolutely critical like you mentioned but right. basic software updates i mean basic software updates is so critical and also just limiting uh kind of the ability for ransomware to spread through a network by closing off you know really bad open ports like the smb port 445 for example that allows for this to spread uh, throughout the network, but that's addressed even in a, a layer of network segmentation, plus then closing off and limiting access only to what is required. So I absolutely agree with you on that. I think now from a collaborative perspective, because ransomware really is, it's, it's not only a problem specific to each individual organization. I think ransomware has a global impact and, I'm I'm just wondering, you know, what collaborative efforts are in place right now or should be developed in order to combat to to really combat these types of threats. Okay. This is something that's always being encouraged for private sector to talk to each other. Now financial industry, they need to talk to each other. This is closed circle of trust. They need to exchange information. Now there is everything is uh, confidential, but this is a closed circle of trust. And there are organizations like FSI sec where you can actually share information that, that is relevant. And this is also being encouraged by the government. On the government level, it's also important now in the US you have something that's called InfraGuard organization where you can actually come and share information. They share it with you, which is which is really important. Um, but when we talk here about uh, when I talked about ransomware in Europe, you know, there is something called um, nomoransom.org, which was the initiative developed by Europol, and it's been out there now for I don't know like six, seven years, something like that. Um, they host decryption keys for different types of of ransomware, which which has proven so many times that it helped people. Now, 
on many occasions you won't be able to decrypt your system because they always keep changing encryption keys but everything that's being the, the, everything that's being collected in different different raids and organizations you know and being discovered by researchers it's put on no more ransom.org and the main the main uh the way they advertise is do not pay because you don't want to pay because if you pay there is a new trend you pay and now you show them you have money well, they will double ransom you okay you have to pay again for something you know so it's actually it's not worth paying for ransom i know some organizations that paid and then they didn't get they were actually defrauded they didn't get their decryption keys or they were asked to pay some more money so and you would do this in desperation so basically sharing information with your peers with similar organizations to yours within the industry within the control environment it's something that's being encouraged and, and that people definitely should do and it's not a one-time event this is the process you know this is something done on on the level of security officers and organizations you know they, they belong to different interest groups you know where, where this information can be can be shared yeah. yeah absolutely absolutely i completely agree threat intelligence sharing um and the actual benefits or enhancements that it allows when it comes to incident response and effective incident response is right. is absolutely critical I, I also think when it comes to backups and disaster recovery, this has a massive role to play when it comes to especially ransomware. I mean, because I, I guess the reason why organizations are so eager to pay and under pressure to pay is because they just mm -hmm. want the data back because they have no disaster recovery or backups in place. So what's, what's your view on that? What are the best practices when it comes to backup and DR plans with regard to ransomware? You know, see, backup and disaster recovery plans, they're critical in defending against ransomware attacks. I've seen so many times small businesses, mid-time businesses, you know, asking for help because they have ransomware. What should I do? And they don't want to pay ransom. My first question was like, do you have a backup? Well, no, because it was expensive. We didn't have time. We didn't have resources. There is always some excuse, but excuse is not going to help you. This is part of developing a cybersecurity strategy. And of course, when you have, and this is the preventive side and when you develop a strategy, but now when you have ransomware, when you're locked, you're in the reactive mode and you're desperately looking for help for somebody to help you. But to avoid that, paying for, for ransomware, you know, when you go on the prevention side, you know, the best practices would include you have to have a regular, regularly scheduled backups to ensure that they're stored both offline and in different environments, so they're immune to ransomware spread. Another thing that you have to do is you need to test this backup that you can restore actually the data that's being on your tapes or wherever you you, you uh, back up your data just to ensure that it works in different scenarios when you when you have situation you need to restore quickly you need to practice for that uh, you need to implement also a backup strategy something that that's called like three two one so you have three different copies of your data Two of the copies are stored locally but on different mediums. They can be, I don't know, on a hard drive and they can be on DVDs, whatever. And the third copy, it's stored off-site in a different loca physical location because you, after all, you may have also fire or earthquake or something happens, you know, this data needs to be stored in a different, different location so it can be accessed when, when you restore your system. And this is not only relevant for, for ransomware, it's actually... Every company that wants to conduct business, you know, they need to care about their data because data is the most valuable thing that the company has. And the most important role in every company, I would say, is this, I would say is somebody who is taking care of your data. So this is information security specialist, this is cybersecurity officer, whoever, you know, people who are taking care of your data, they're actually safeguarding your company, safeguarding customers, safeguarding your reputation and everything. So you have to incorporate your disaster recovery plans that would outline all steps for different types of incidents. Because as I said, ransomware is not the only one. There is also an you know, earthquake, there is fire, there is, I don't know, it can be, it can be, every company needs to create scenarios that they think, I mean, there, there could be also meteor strike. 
Now, this is something that, that uh, my past organization, we discussed many times. Okay, we are creating scenarios when the meteor is going to to asteroid, is going to hit the town. It's never going to happen. And then there was something, I think in Russia somewhere, there was, there was like the, the, the asteroid fell, you know, the, the half of the city was destroyed, which was really interesting. Like, oh, so it does happen, you know. And you're basically preparing your whole career for something that may not even happen. But it's important to have scenarios. So when something happens, the easiest thing is like, okay, let's get this document. Everything is outlined. The steps are here. We know what to do. So when you follow these practices, you know, you can minimize actually the downtime of your system and you can minimize the data loss just in the, in the event of unfortunate event. We're yeah. discussing here ransomware, but it's actually a much, much wider topic. Yeah. Completely, okay. yeah. Yeah. Okay, so let's move from uh, ransomware to something that's also closely related to ransomware. It's about geopolitical uh, cyber threats, and why is cybersecurity here important? It's important because when you when you look how, for instance, you look at it in the U.S., there are five layers of defense, or actually five five battlefields. It's land air, Navy, space, and there's cyberspace. So when you put this in the geopolitical context, the cyberspace, you get cyber threats. And we are discussing earlier APTs, active persistent threats with ransomware. Somebody is, you get phishing, you download malware, somebody sits in your network, I don't know, for eight months and conducts all the espionage techniques and everything, you know, and, and learns about your, your company. So they're usually uh, state-sponsored because for for different different purposes, and it's been more important than ever. Now, see, we're talking. We start talking also about, about the AI, which is also important now in geopolitical context, because this is so called 2024. It's called the election year. Two thirds of the world is going in election. So the, from the geopolitical cyber threat perspective. It's more important than ever because there is influence operations, disinformation operations, deep fake operations, all kind of stuff that is trying to manipulate our mind for somebody to access access the, the data. So it's the geopolitical tensions, you know, they're really a real threat and governments are conducting what they can, you know, to protect themselves. But there is also offensive measure, there is a defensive measure. So yeah. Really, yeah. really interesting topic. Yeah. Yeah, I think geopolitical tensions, you know, lead to it definitely does lead to increased cyber espionage. And so also specifically more cybersecurity attacks to critical assets to a particular government, be it, you know, just public entities or public organizations or even private entities that do a large contribution to a country's economy. You know, those are all then targets of these these increasing uh, targeted attacks. But also, I think it also influences how governments then and international authorities then collaborate on the cybersecurity side. So, I mean, do you see that as more and more common when we think about kind of the, you know, the geopolitical cyber espionage manifesting in the cybersecurity domain? Do you see more and more governments collaborating with each other? Is that already happening today? Well, they're actually collaborating with each other and against each other, <laughs> because this is actually, we're talking about the influence operations. They're aimed at achieving different strategic objectives for, for each country. And these activities, they can target government networks, they can target critical infrastructure, they can target private sector that we were discussing before, how vulnerable they are, um, and only with the idea to steal the sensitive information, to disrupt services, and to sway public opinion also. And the impact, when you talk about governments, you know, the impact on, on global cybersecurity policies and practices uh, also includes uh, heightened vigilance, increased investment in national cyber defense, which is, which is really important in cyber defense capabilities, and also in the development of um, international norms and agreements uh, that are going, they're, they're aimed into curbing malicious cyber activities. 
So when we talk about cooperation between different governments, between different nations, you know, they're more focused, more focused on establishing cybersecurity alliances and also sharing intelligence just to counteract these threats collectively. And this is something that, that we see and that, that it's happening. I cannot talk now about different cases, but uh, people who are interested to explore more, I can direct them on the, on the internet, just go on the web and ask this question and you will actually find out what is happening in each country, who are the adversarial countries, how they're attacking, why they're attacking. Um, I mean, there, there are cases like, like Cambridge Analytica, everybody heard about it probably by now. Uh, Brexit, uh, this was everything was part of the state sponsor attack. Uh, influencing operations, how to change hearts and minds of people in certain areas, and this is, as I said before, you know, this is uh, this year is the, the the election year, and we'll see a lot, a lot happening, and it's already happening, especially now with the with the elections in the U.S. in November. You know, we'll see the rise of deep fakes, the rise of uh, different types of attacks. You know, it's it's really daring times. That, that yeah. We were, you know. Yeah, I think when we talk about the state-sponsored activities specifically, it, it is so sophisticated, you know, and it, it involves specialist hacking techniques. It involves kind of the longer term exfiltration. It involves kind of that stealthy behavior and the stealthy exfiltration. Right. And it's only really seen after the fact. But I'm wondering, are there specific characteristics of state sponsored cyber activities and and how can organizations then identify these and protect themselves against it well you see the cyber activities from their state sponsored they're they're stealthy and they're aiming for strategic gains rather than than financial profit when we're talking about malware and ransomware we're talking about the financial profit but here when we talk about state sponsored attacks you know they're going actually for influence and for strategic gains. So when we talk about characteristics, I mentioned before APTs, active persistent threats. You know, they're being used, you know, it's like it's malware downloading your computer on your information system, and uh, it's used for long-term espionage. And the way it, it exploits uh, zero-day vulnerability and there is a multi-stage intrusion technique that's being uh, difficult to detect. So the way uh, the organizations can uh, protect against such threats is by implementing a really robust cybersecurity framework that will include threat intelligence sharing that we mentioned before, uh, employing advanced threat detection and, and response tools, uh, conducting regular security assessments and, and training. Uh, so it's really important that all, all of this is recognized because you need, you need a plan. You can't just do like, I don't know, we have antivirus and we're safe. No, this, this you need a plan actually how to, how to protect on, on, on different layers. And it's really, it's really difficult and it's really sophisticated, more sophisticated than ever, than ever. Now with the rise of AI, everything is multiplies times 10. Yeah, exactly. And and Tom, I know we're running close to the end here, but one one final question that I have from my side on this is around critical infrastructure. I mean, protecting critical infrastructure is so important. So how can critical infrastructure be protected against th this geopolitical cyber threat landscape? And what role does the government or regulation play in, in safeguarding critical mm -hmm. infrastructure? So we talked before about collaboration, about sharing information. So the only way to protect is actually it's that collaborative effort between government and the private sector, because they cannot go without each other. They have to work together. So the government regulation, it's we're truly playing a crucial role in setting a minimum cybersecurity standards. And it mandates for critical sectors, like there, there are seven of them, you know, like financial, transportation, health, you know, don't have to talk about all of them, but it's really important that all these sectors, key sectors, critical infrastructure is being uh, protected by, in a way that they're encouraging that information sharing between different sectors, because what's happening to somebody may happen to somebody else, you know, they're not independent islands, it's all one 
part part of one ecosystem and they need to share information and they also the government is providing support they need to provide support in the event of an attack even organizations they can provide support to each other in the event of, of attack uh, then um, critical infrastructure entities they need to adopt also a strategy a cybersecurity strategy that i mentioned before that would include all these parts of threat intelligence physical and cyber risk assessments because everything is after all is based on the on the risk assessment uh, employee training again i mentioned this so many times today but employee training it's so important that they, that your employees know how to behave in on with the information system and what is good what is not good you know this critical thinking it's more important than ever um then I was talking about when I mentioned Europol, for instance, this nomoransom.org, uh, and there are different different organizations in the world. This is something that's called public-private partnership, also. And the, on the international level, this cooperation, this is key for sharing best practices and for sharing threat intelligence resources, also. Because what you want to do at the end, you want to increase your resilience of critical infrastructure that will protect you know from uh, sophisticated state sponsor threats yeah so i hope yeah. i hope i answer your question um absolutely okay so this slide here it's actually um when we talk about risk it's a little bit a summary of everything that that's being discussed so i, I have put here continuous education and training you know and the importance of webinars like this is also we are raising public awareness we're discussing these topics because it's really important for everybody to understand how this works so we can be prepared either as as individuals as private citizens but we also prepared it when we go back to our organizations we understand there is a threat you know there is there are things i can do there are things i cannot do the use of different technologies mentioned AI, you know, this is going now through every every discussion I have is about AI, but we're we are leveraging this advanced technologies now by implementing AI in cybersecurity. We're using large language models, you know, in education to train employees. We're using large language models in security operation centers to analyze first level of support. It's being used everywhere it's to monitor your network, it's also artificial intelligence. It's really important. Machine learning, artificial intelligence, really important that, that, that the organizations have this the frameworks. You need to know how you do something. You know, So this is why it's important to get frameworks developed by governments, to develop your own company frameworks, because this, these are your rules your best practices, whatever, you know. But this is actually the framework that we use and how we implement cybersecurity. And then the, the fourth thing, this is basically the summary of everything that we have discussed, it's collaboration. As I said, you know, between different companies, between if different individuals, industries, public, private, more important, more important than ever. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I agree. I think one final takeaway from me here is that the reality is that every single organization is going to have to implement or use in some form whether whether they are consciously aware of it or not they are going to use ai they are going to be impacted by the use of ai outside of the organization potentially to target the organization so the best thing is to really become equipped really become skilled and knowledgeable and make AI and cybersecurity a core priority and link the two together, right? Because that's ultimately what's what's going to help us with those four points that you mentioned there as well. Mm -hmm. I completely agree. Agree with you. Uh, I don't know how we're doing with time. Yeah. Let me see. I think oh, we're, we're at the end. I can't believe it. It's been already one hour. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Okay. Before like I move on, though, there are a couple of questions from the audience, and I invite the audience in general if they have specific questions to take this opportunity and write in the Q and A session. So there is a question from Fabius asking, why would not some filter based on central reputation and industry standard settings like SPF, DKIM, etc., be the first line of defense? I think the organization already implement email security for exactly the reason, Hornet, Retaros, etc. Well, the thing is, 
you can do it however you want. You know, it's about your strategy. You know, it's how it's based on your risk appetite. It's based on your risk assessment. So if you, as an organization, estimate your risk as, I don't know, like medium or low or high, whatever, from spam, from phishing, you know, you need to grade it. Rate, sorry, you need to rate it. And then you make decisions. Okay, this is how we solve. We will have spam filter as number one that will protect, that will guard us. It doesn't have to be. It's... I'm not the one to say how you're going to do it. It all depends of the management board of each organization, how they actually value what is their risk appetite and what they want, how much they want to invest after all. Once you put all risks together and you understand how you, your risk-based approach works and how your risk appetite works, then you can actually come up with the investment plan. So if it's too much, maybe, I don't know, you're being too careful. So you would lower your, your risk appetite so you don't invest so much money. Meaning then, okay, let's put spam filter as number one. It doesn't have to be. It can be. It doesn't have to be. It's it's up to uh, each organization to decide what they want to do. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I hope we're Sorry. Absolutely. And mm -hmm. maybe just to add there, so yes, the spam filter and email filters, can be the first line of defense, absolutely. But that's exactly what it is. It's only the first line of defense. It's only one aspect and component. And here, we, when we think about AI and cybersecurity, we really have to think about defense in depth because these, these attacks are more advanced. They mm -hmm. are built to pass through your spam filter and they are built to surpass your first line of defense, right? So that's also maybe something to consider. Thank you. Thank you both. Thank you, Venetia and Dom, for that. And there is another question um, from Jimmy. is asking, how can someone develop AI Prime? AI Prime. I don't know what you're aiming to <laughs> for AI Prime. <laughs> Are we talking about Agi, about uh, artificial general intelligence or something? I would direct you to, uh, to watch on YouTube uh, Jensen Huang from NVIDIA. Uh, his keynote speech from yesterday. So when you see everything that they had developed already, all the, all the technology, it's just amazing. I got chills last night watching this, you know, everything that is out there and we are so close to Agi. This is probably Prime that you're mentioning. And and artificial general intelligence, so some predictions are 2026 we'll have it, but we will see, you know, developing intelligence systems that will be basically independent from us. And I think we're so close to it. Very exciting. Okay. As you said, we need to embrace this anyway. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> okay. So, first of all, thank you so much, Tom and Venetia, for your time. And um, this recording is, is going to be available on YouTube as well. So, if anyone wants then to ask you questions after that, they can reach you on LinkedIn, I suppose, or write to us, and we will direct the other questions. Okay. For the time being, thank you so much for your, for your time. Thank you, everyone, for joining thank us. You. Thank you, Venetia, for joining us here also. Of course. Thanks, Tom. I will just close up with a couple of slides. I know that we have just been running out of time, but just about um, our program. So um, if you are interested in getting to know more about a technology, cybersecurity, artificial intelligence, we offer at OP two bachelor degrees in one in computer science, the other one in digital business, and four master of sciences, one in applied data science and artificial intelligence, another one in enterprise cybersecurity, where Tom is the director, um, another one in applied digital business, and finally a, a master of science in responsible artificial intelligence, which is a more technical one. So all our programs are embedded with of course, artificial intelligence. And when it comes to cybersecurity, we have both the bachelor in computer science with the track in cybersecurity and the master in enterprise cybersecurity. So I'm not going to go through the content of each of the program, but I invite you to join us on the 28th of March, where we're going to go through these programs and to the deep how to study with us and what it means to study with us. So I am going to send then an invitation to all of you. But just in general, we have... Um, the core term and the electives and the dissertation or internship in the bachelor degrees, while in the master's we have the core foundational, then you just get into the applied part, and finally you do your dissertation or um, project with the company at the end. Um, the studying with us means like uh, online, but means also like a lot of live and recorded content, so you do lessons like the ones that we are just done today live and, and then you just before and after you also have some recorded content you have support 
the student support tutors that are available every day of the week, the career service as well. And our methodology is based on a competence-based approach. So you will learn the skill, apply the skill, and then do an assignment, a progressive assessment or assignment, so that there are no final theoretical exams, but more like a progressive assessment and understanding of the skills. We also make sure that everything is professionally aligned with what companies want today. As you've seen, we're very like keen on understanding the evolution of what's happening and the impact of what's happening on the life and work of everybody. Uh, moreover, you have the opportunity to study, um, to shorten your study with the fast track option so that if you do the bachelor, you can study over two years instead of three. And if you do the master over one year instead of one year and a half. Okay, just to apply is quite simple. Uh, you have to fill in the form, send us your documents, your level of English should be a B2. If you don't have a certificate, you can just provide it to us later on. Uh, we also recognize previous study and work experience for credit transfer. And then when you just send you as your documentation, we're going to have an interview. And then you can start with us in September. Uh, the fees are 2250 per term, and the bachelor runs over six terms, the master over three terms. And we have the option to pay in advance with 10% discount or a scholarship up to 40%. Okay, and so you can meet with us, you can talk to our students, you can talk with like uh, myself or my the team that I work with. We have uh, two opening one opening class tomorrow. And so more about artificial intelligence. So if in case you have time tomorrow at 12 Central European time, uh, Professor Casale will open his class to um, uh, anyone who wants to join. We, there is a guest speaker. We're going to talk about advances in medical application in artificial intelligence. Or if you want to know more about the programs, how to study, the content, how it's designed, the support that you're going to receive, we have a presentation on Thursday, March 28th at 5 p.m. And I'm going to be there. Okay, so I'm going to leave you the contacts for anything, uh, the, if you have any questions or if you want just to get to know more about uh, Opus or you have questions for Tom and Venetia, you can write to hello at opus.com or just send us a WhatsApp message, visit our website or book a call with us. Okay, so I suppose <laughs> I am finished here. I see if there is, uh, there is another question for Tom and Venetia, if you're still there. Um, Okay, so it's from Crystal. I don't know, Tom or Venetia. Okay, I think Crystal, if uh, Venetia is here, perfect. There is a question about, um, it's not content related. She would like to know uh, what advice you have for tackling the US developments within cybersecurity as it is ever changing. Any suggestions there? Yeah, I think uh, from my side, I mean, that's a great question. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was going to start the answer with, you know what, um, you never sleep. But uh, of <laughs> course, <laughs> that, that that's not going to work. Um, I think the reality is that in cybersecurity, not everyone can focus on everything, right? So the reality is that that's why, I mean, the industry is massive. There are so many areas to focus in. And as an organization, you have to have a holistic cybersecurity strategy, but you have individuals uh, or individual teams that's going to focus on the advancement specifically in each focus area. So in this case, from a skilling perspective and from a career perspective, I think you have to really just try and focus on one area in cybersecurity that you are working in currently and really try and stay ahead and advance your knowledge Try and understand how AI impacts your specific area in cybersecurity. So if you are in detection, try and understand the capabilities of AI in the detection space. If you are in cloud, try and understand it for cloud. Uh, because if you're trying to understand everything as a whole, uh, that, that will be a really, really big challenge. I Thank completely you so agree much. with you. It's a holistic approach. This is the summary of everything. <laughs> okay. Thank you so much for for your comments and, and answer to the questions. Um, if there are no other specific questions, I am going to thank you again for having like hosted this webinar. It was very, very interesting. I'm scared now, but let's see <laughs> what is going to happen <laughs> in the future. And I also thank all the audience for being with us tonight. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.